Um, up next, we've got our sort of afternoon of skills workshops and having seen some of the presentations loaded up, they look really great, so I'm really excited. And to chair this afternoon session, we're very, very uh, honoured to have Professor Michelle Leach, and uh, she's uh, my dean, so I better say nice things about her, but luckily they're true. Um, she's a fantastic uh, dean and mentor, a rheumatologist by training and clinician scientist as well herself, and you'll hear more about her later on the panel, but for now, uh, here she is to introduce the session. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone, and welcome back after lunch. And thank you so much to, to Eddie and Ingrid for inviting me. And I think it's only through the agency of people like uh, Ingrid and Eddie that you could uh, hope to pull together the kinds of people that we have here today for this session um, on what skills as a clinician scientist need. And I, I have to say that uh, these people that have been pulled together for this session are the elite athletes, the veritable rock stars of uh, clinician science. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who's Professor Ronaldo Belomo. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne, but uh, is also an honorary professor of medicine at about seven other universities as well. Um, and he's the director of the uh, intensive care at the Austin Hospital, as many of you may know. I know Ronaldo from the past, um, when I was a resident at Prince Henry's Hospital, and he was an uh, incredibly dynamic registrar. Um, he had all this incredible frenetic energy and iconoclasm, and I can see that it's translated very well into an incredibly successful career as a clinician scientist. I was looking at some Twitter feed last night and saw that uh, he, in fact, uh, has published three New England Journal papers uh, within 24-hour period. Uh, and, and this just gives you an idea of how insane he actually is. So thank you very much, Ronaldo. He's going to talk about how to select and structure a research question. Thank you very much. Michelle, it's, it's wonderful to see you again. It's, it's great. She was fantastic even then. That's wonderful. Um, I noted that there is another symposium just outside for infinite wealth. <laughs> Are you sure you're in the right place? Okay, just establishing that first. And uh, I realize it's after lunch and you're probably half asleep. You're probably thinking like those guys, but I'll try to entertain you as well as inform you. So what I hope to do is to provide some perspective about uh, some of the brief that I've been given, uh, make you smile every now and then, make you reflect about what it is that we're trying to do and explain to you about how to select a research question, how to structure it, and give you some practical advice on how to deal with that. When you select a research question, it's very important that you realize we go into these tunnels of thinking with closed minds, with lots of prejudices already that might actually be wrong. And John Maynard Keynes nicely said it. It's not the problem of having new ideas, it's getting rid of the old ones that are in our heads. And it's also important that you should understand that whatever question you're going to raise and whatever process of research you're going to embark upon, it's going to take you a while to get there. You'll have to wait for people like me to die. As Max Planck said, you've got to wait for the old professors to die, get out of the way, and finally you have a new generation of people with new ideas. And you have to understand that if you're too far ahead of your time to get into trouble, and so you have to have a process that takes into account different time frames. JC was a big guy, had great ideas 2,000 years ago. It didn't go well. <laughs> Galileo, Galileo was about 100 years ahead of his time, and you know he suffered incarceration and the Inquisition. Uh, if you're about 30 years ahead of your time, most of your colleagues will laugh at you, will think you're wrong. And, tease you, but, but, but you might yet live to see admiration come your way, but you're not sure. If you're about 10 years ahead of your time, they'll show this sort of polite curiosity, oh, that might be a good idea, and, you know, let's see what happens. And if you're about five years, there'll be furious debate at conferences, people will say you're wrong, and you will argue, and God knows whatever. And if you're about two or three years ahead of your time, I can guarantee you academic success. The problem is you don't know where you are. So you have to have multiple plans. <laughs> so my, my daughter's 23, and when she was 18, she told us she had met a nice young man that she liked. And I said to my wife, I've got a photo of her boyfriend. I said, what? You're kidding me. I want to look at it. And there it was. And she said, oh my god. <laughs> 
We said, what's wrong? Why don't you want her to go out with him? Hell, no way, no way. So, darling, you've married him. This is me at 17. <laughs> and the reason, the reason for showing that to you is to give you perspective of how time changes and the fact that it's a journey, okay? 11 years later, I'm at Prince Henry's now, I'm a second year resident there, look at that, look a bit more presentable, it's my first paper in Kidney International. Uh, I'm still the same guy, but you know, I'm kind of looking a little bit more respectable, and it's a journey, just been working towards that. So, how do you select a question if you want to do research? The bad, the bad news is you can't do it. To select a question, you need to know a lot of stuff. You need to know the relevant literature in detail. You need to appreciate what kind of questions matter, what you should ask and what you shouldn't. You have to understand whether you have the means to address that question. You can't do that, right? You don't really know at your level of training, education and learning what is real that you read and what is surreal. And as you can see there, the amount of energy necessary to eliminate bullshit is about 10 times higher than the appearance of it in the literature. And it takes a lot of effort. You need a huge amount of knowledge. It takes years to accumulate it. Clinical research is incredibly complex, incredibly challenging, and it's a lot like what you read in the newspapers, like in that cartoon. Now, yeah, it works, it's fantastic. It's a lot of work and a lot of time. But the good news is that even though you don't know, there are people who do know, who spent a lifetime trying to understand issues, problems, fields, and they have a sense of perspective that they can give to you, working with you to develop the right question. They are clinicians who worked in the field. They are people that have created research structures that enable you to address the questions. They're the people who are going to help you select the right questions. When you find these people, not at the pub, although occasionally they might be there, but they're in different places where these structures, we, these endeavors are taking place. They're not difficult to find. In today's world, you can find out about people in different fields, in Australia, and in the world for that matter, very easily. Who are these people? Who are these desperados that instead of going to the seminar on infinite wealth, spend all their working hours <laughs> trying to solve problems in clinical medicine and research, they are people that have a passion for what they're doing. They are really passionate about what they are doing. I've been like that since I was 17. I just can't help myself. It's a disease. I always want to know whatever the truth is. And some of them are even intensivists. Now, you may not even know what intensive care is. Some of you might have been in one. Some of you might have heard about it. Intensive care is not this. This is intensive care on television. You know, he's in a coma, right? Lying there in intensive care with all the relos sitting around the bedside. You're kidding? This is intensive care. Intensive care is people on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, mechanical ventilation, hemofiltration. You know, it's a completely different world, okay? But it's a unique world, and it's a world that is increasing in magnitude in significance and that is dealing with people that are extremely sick and it's a wonderfully fertile area of research because it is faced with all the extremes of physiology pharmacology and human and ethical thinking so it's a very interesting thing and that's why i love being an intensivist and i always say to my fellows intensivists are like ducks <laughs> You know, <laughs> we can do all three things. <laughs> so how do you pick a mentor to help you phrase a question? Or oh, there are a million ways. It might be a chance encounter in your medical course or a presentation that you like, that you want to follow up on. Somebody in a field that for some reason you're interested in, something you've heard about. Uh, or you've chosen to do a scholarly elective and you've met a person that you think you can work with. How do you know that you can work with these people? How do you know that they're not intolerable, unbearable, self-important assholes? <laughs> right? You don't. The answer is you don't. That's a problem. 
And the only way you can find out is to inquire. Go meet them, visit them, listen to them, make up your mind, ask around. Maybe you're a fit with a particular person, but not with another person. Like, just find out names of people that work with them. Call them up. Go and see them. Speak to them. Ask them what it's like. Check the kind of work that they're doing. Check the kind of work that they're publishing. We're all open to the public through PubMed, Medline, the media. Uh, it's, it's very easy to find out about people that might help you select a question. So the bottom line is that you can only select a research question together with a team because the team know the resources available, they know what can be done, they know whether it can be done in the term of time that is available to you, whether it's a year, six months, two years, three years, a PhD, four years. They know whether it can be done. There's no point embarking upon an activity with a high likelihood that the time frame available to you is not sufficient. And there are team members that can help you when there are problems. They know what matters. They know what doesn't matter. They know what will sell because publication is important. And they know how to help you sell it. All right? This is not a sea panda. This is a killer whale. Right? It sells. And it's really important. Let me just give you a practical example of what it might look like, which is a real example. A medical student came to us a couple of years ago. They spent a few weeks with us doing some summer work with us. They had fun. They liked us. We liked him. So he was a nice guy. Uh, we worked in a few projects, completed a couple of studies, had a few presentations, the meetings. That's great. And you can tell that a person likes doing this stuff. Some people do it because they have to, but you can tell this person enjoyed doing it. They like standing up like I am and telling the story. There's going to be a little bit of showmanship there, right? So they like it. That's great. So he said, can I do a Bachelor of Medical Science with you? Yes, that's great. Let's do that. Now, what question should we ask? Okay? How do we pick the question? Well, we have all sorts of information available to us that that person couldn't possibly have. I have about 108 projects underway. That person cannot know that, but I can, I can match I've got like a menu of clothing on the rack. And I can say, look, you've got this period of time. This is what's happening. This is what's hot. This is what's evolving. It's happening right now. We've got the opportunity. We've got the resources. We've got the people. We've got the team. We've got everything to support you. We can make it happen. That person cannot know this, but we do, right? And this is, in particular case, we found, we just finished a study showing that Increasing CO2 in people with mechanical, uh, mechanically ventilated after cardiac arrest was increasing cerebral oxygenation. That's a big deal. And we wanted to explore that in other patient groups. And we had a limited period of time. This person didn't know that these two papers were about to be published, that showing that there was an effect on cardiac arrest patients and showing a clear effect on increasing the pCO2 on cerebral oxygenation measured by near-infrared spectroscopy. That person couldn't possibly know this, okay? But irrespective of us helping set the question, we needed to select somebody who was willing to work very hard because this is no picnic. And so we also have to make a judgment because somebody might be coming there and they're trying to be good and they're trying to do what their mom expects them to do, but they really don't have their heart in it. And so we want to see that there is a two-way activity, that that person is really committed to this. Okay. And once you've got to that, then together we discuss, which, you know, how should we do it? Can we do it? How can we do it? Which patients are we going to select to take this further? What are the appropriate targets for that kind of investigation? Can we get enough patients of the ones we want in six months? How do we assess a biological effect? How do we assess the clinical meaning of whatever it is that we're going to do? What kind of resources do we need? A person by themselves cannot address those questions. Science is a complicated game, and it requires a lot of knowledge. It is not what you see in the newspapers that every day tell you study shows that spanking turns children into terrorists or saints or if you eat an apple a day, you will be 20 kilograms thinner, all that sort of stuff. 
That is not the way we do science. You also have to have direction. This is not, <laughs> this is not what we would want to do, even though it was a dominant form of resuscitation in the 17th century. So we need to show that uh, anal insufflation is not a good way to go. <laughs> so what are the kind of patients we want to focus on? We want to focus, for example, in our situation, in patients having cardiopulmonary bypass. Why? Because they have a kind of cardiac arrest-like situation. They lose pulsatility during cardiopulmonary bypass. There are a lot of them. It is highly uh, relevant as a model, and it's a population that develops neurocognitive dysfunction after they've had cardiopulmonary bypass. And that may be associated with the way in which we protect their oxygenation during the operation and immediately after the, after the operation, and CO2 management might be a really important way to help them achieve that. So we feel that that's the way to go, but that's together in, the, in a discussion with the student or with the researcher, because we got all that information. And then we say we need to do an interventional study because they are much more powerful. We need to randomize people because we've got to have a control group, because we've got to see that what we do has some meaning. And then once you say that, you need to define the intervention specifically, the population, the measurement, the primary outcome, the secondary outcome, sample size, statistical power, need to randomize, need to consider confounders. All of these issues must be done together with a mentor because it's the first time you're going to do that. Having a control group is essential for us to be able to make judgments about what we do. Okay. And then you come to structuring the questions. Okay. And again, we begin to teach you specificity of phrasing, specificity of identification of the exact question that you're going to ask. Yes, the ultimate question is, can we protect the brain of people having cardiopulmonary bypass from injury? But we cannot answer that question yet. We can only ask specifically this question. During cardiopulmonary bypass, if we increase the PaCO2 during the period of post-operative mandatory ventilation by modifying gas flow and respiratory rate, and can we increase the area under the curve for near infrared spectroscopy derived cerebral tissue oxygenation from the start of cardiopulmonary bypass to the end of mandatory ventilation? There's a, you know, it's a mouthful, but, but this is the specific initial question, which we hope in time will lead us to an understanding. For example, not, oh, can we protect the brain from injury, but for example, looking at biomarkers of injury like neuron-specific NLAs as a specific indicator of what it is that we're looking at. Not, can we protect brain function, but can we assess whether our intervention affects neurocognitive performance with standardized tests in these patients? So you can see that the structuring of the question becomes very specific, very pertinent to the very, to the very steps that you're taking, uh, taking to test, and also very specific and very measurable. It has to be measurable. Now, some questions can be answered or tested or assessed in patients. Some require animal models. And so we are forever moving from one to another. But animal models are also very demanding and very specific. Some people may not feel bad, may feel bad about babe having this kind of treatment, but they're all under general anesthesia. But they all suffer. Just want to reassure you. Some people might think we do bad things to animals. They're treated better than human beings. And you can see that significant technology can come into place. And again, this is fascinating stuff. This is cutting edge stuff. It is available stuff. But there's no way you can be in a position to set the question about this kind of intervention without working together. We can put animals on cardiopulmonary bypass. This is an anesthetized, intubated sheep on cardiopulmonary bypass. And we can ask some of these questions that I've talked about in human beings also in animal models in order to better understand the physiology, the pathophysiology, the molecular biology consequences, and so on. Again, all of these are available, but the significance, importance, ability, resources, time commitment vary 
with the question that you're trying to address, and you cannot know that unless you work together with a group of people that do this all the time. It is unreasonable <laughs> to expect, it is unre this is from one of my fellows, he just sent it to me last week. This is, it is unreasonable for you to be expecting that you can ask the questions and develop them alone. And as you experience the challenges of research as a, an older person, you also realize that you have to have backup plans. Because whatever you think might be true, whatever you think is going to happen, has a very reasonable chance of not really happening and not really working out. Whether it's technology, or whether it's patient recruitment, or whether it is resource availability, or whatever it may be. So if you've got a limited period of time to do your work, you and your mentor must have plan B. Because if you want to be successful, you've got to be able to have plan B if plan A doesn't work. You might well ask, if it is so damn complicated, right, and you need a team to help you, why, why should we do it? And the answer is because the alternative is what we see every day in our lives, a colossal amount of madness, which is totally evidence-free, from politics to education, from history to sociology, a world where rhetoric and ideology triumph over evidence. We don't want you to go down like the lemmings. Please, don't do it. Turn right. Turn right. The battle between evidence and prejudice is the biggest battle in the world today. Today. Please join the evidence side of it. Please join the evidence side of it. Please. It is so much better. Now you might think, I'm gonna end up you know, being like a really serious, nerdy kind of guy, and I'm gonna be never smiling and all that kind of stuff. That's not true, it's a lot of fun. And you know, occasionally, we make the wrong decision. Occasionally, we test the hypothesis and things don't work out. But the important thing is that we always want to put the most important country in the world on top of the world. And always say that God has created Americans in order to provide us with a target to beat every time. <laughs> and more importantly, Whatever you do, whatever the question is that you want to ask, whatever the process is you want to follow, whatever the mentor it is that you want to choose, whatever it is that you choose to investigate, whatever the subject, for the love of God, remember this. Because if you want to be a happy person, don't go to the seminar next door. Infinite wealth. What? <laughs> what? Infinite pursuit, relentless pursuit, of excellence. So if you do that, does that lead you to anything? This is the final product that was sent to me by uh, our BMED Sci student uh, last time. It's just been submitted to Journal of Critical Care uh, this week. So you, you get your manuscript. And uh, this uh, he sent to me yesterday, the day before yesterday, from Townsville. Uh, Monash, yeah, they were really pumped. Uh, we led the team, we had the best uh, medical school in the world. <laughs> that, that's right. I've got a job at the Alfred, which may or may not be good. I'm not so sure. Uh, and all is happening. And I'm going to London for my elective. And, and this is uh, Patrick there. And I will make no comments about uh, the choice of shorts here. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. And I am not responsible as a mentor for this kind of uh, behavior. This is the last slide. It's a journey. I didn't look like this when I was 17, okay? It's a journey, and it just goes on and on and on. What's special about it is that you're looking for evidence, you're looking for excellence, you're working with a team, you're working with like-minded people. It's an incredible journey. It's exciting. There isn't a day, there isn't a day that there isn't a question, a new insight, a new possibility, a new process, a new technology 
that we can apply to try to understand the world we live in and the patients we look after. And even when you get old like me, you still feel the passion. It never goes away. And that's from Tennyson. It never goes away. It can't stop. It's in your heart. And it enriches you, and it's a wonderful thing. And it's a lot better than the other seminar guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ronaldo. Absolutely magnificent. I think there's a really good research question about how you turn from a moody Italian rock star into a, a red-headed, tie-wearing nerd. Um, <laughs> so, don't know how he did it. The mystery but, of biology. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please come to the microphone and uh, to ask or put up your hand. And there's roving microphones. And just while people might be standing up and moving to the microphone, I might just ask you, Ronaldo. Do you? How do? I mean, you. You said that you know, these students can't select a research question. I have a great deal of trouble imagining you, um, you know, your unsuspecting mentor with all of the passion and will that you have, not somehow having enormous influence on the first research question that you asked. What was it? Look, the, 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 first, the first thing that I did, I was a medical student, mm. and I went up and I said, I want to do research. I said, oh, you know, you're medical student, you're busy doing the course, you okay. oh God, I feel like I can only do that, I, I can sort that out in two hours. Mm. What do I do after that? Mm. Um, and so it was Steve Holdsworth, oh. who was uh, to become <laughs> the professor of medicine. <laughs> and I went, to, I went to his office and he'd just come back from La Jolla. Mm. And I instant I immediately liked him. Mm. And I, the reason I immediately liked him is that he was wearing American boots. Mm. He, had the, he had his feet on the table, right? He was <laughs> leaning back and said to me, okay, let's do something. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I ended up injecting rabbits for a model of glomerulonephritis at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And we just developed in the model. It was a lot of fun, and, and I never looked back. I thought, mm. this is the most fun I can have on mm. this planet. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a kind of a relationship. Mm. And I think that's really important. Mm. And that can inspire people to feel that mm. this is OK. You know, this mm. can be done, and you can be a fun person. Yeah. I think you've inspired a lot of people today. Are there any, any questions from the audience? Just put up your hand up high if you have one. Um, if not, um, I probably would move on. I'm just looking at the co-chairs here to check. And thank Ronaldo, who has to rush off to one of his 108 uh, research projects, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ronaldo. <laughs> So uh, it's a pleasure now to uh, intru introduce Professor Melissa Little, um, who's head of the Kidney Research Laboratory at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and a professor at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she's an alumnus of the University of Queensland and she's got 20 years uh, experience as a bioscientist. And I think that uh, she is really uh, the, the most eminent person we could possibly have to address this particular subject area, which is really how to, uh, tips and tricks to get your research published. And for someone who I don't think uh, even gets out of bed for an impact factor less than 30, uh, who, fre who frequently publishes in Nature, I think we've really got, uh, we've got some things to learn. I'll be in the front row taking notes. Thanks, Melissa. I'm not actually sure I'm, if I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, I can see some people I know. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I have a confession to start with, uh, and that is that I'm not a clinician. So I'll just say that right up front. Uh, when I finished school, I thought I was going to be an artist, uh, and I didn't know what an en engineer was, so I thought they drove trains. And um, someone said, you really should do medicine. And I said, but I don't really want to be a doctor. I thought I was going to be a zoologist, and, and, and I did science. And in my first year of of science uh, at University of Queensland, I discovered physiology. And physiology and biochemistry is what I've really done. And th that's really evolved into, into molecular biology, developmental biology, and ultimately into stem cell biology. I'd really reinforce a lot of the things you just heard. Uh, the, the questions that you really need to ask uh, are the ones you can't even think about now, because there's very few things that you can think of that somebody else won't think about, but it's really looking <laughs> towards uh, you know, the big picture items in the distance. And a lot of what I was taught when I was going through as an undergraduate is now not dogma any longer. 
uh, things like uh, you have a certain number of neurons and during your life you're going to just have them all die. We actually now know that there are stem cells in the brain that are actually turning over neurons. Things like a cell becomes a cell type and that's the end of the story is, is now completely uh, not dogma. We actually now know that you can reprogram a cell into a completely different state. And so what you're being taught now is not necessarily wrong, but it's going to change. And you have to remain aware of that and you have to think outside of the square. Um, I have a, a friend who's actually a politician, he's not a scientist, and he talks about a story that's applicable not just to science but to, to life. And he talks about the scientist who's actually in his bedroom and he gets a new uh, telescope and he's extremely excited about this telescope. He's so excited about this telescope he sets it up in his bedroom and he spends the rest of his life looking at the ceiling never takes it outside. So you've really got to remember to go outside and see what's happening around you and not stay incredibly focused down in, on your particular part of the world. So that's a bit of a preamble. I think I can now go forward. I've been asked about um, how to write a manuscript. It seems a little, after Rinaldo's passionate story, a little bit boring, um, but it is part of what you do uh, as a clinician scientist, as a biomedical scientist. Um, and here's an even more boring term, and that's project management. Uh, you probably don't formally learn project management. It's the sort of thing business people and engineers learn. But effectively, as, as a, a clinician scientist or a scientist, what we do is uh, manage projects. So you've talked a bit about deciding what your, what your research project is going to be and what your question is going to be. You then have to plan exactly how you're going to answer that question. Uh, and you've really got to define your question based around what you know and what the field is telling you, uh, and then have a think about how you're going to address that question uh, and how you think the project's going to unfold, and then go about executing it. Uh, and having, as you're executing it, you need to evaluate where you, whether it's actually working. Uh, so monitoring your ongoing performance, seeing if you need to modify your plan, uh, and then go back and execute again. And so this is a loop that goes on endlessly, and some would say in a laboratory on a daily basis with going, I really shouldn't have done it that way, I'm really going to have to change this and go back again. You can't keep doing this loop forever, of course, because you'll never produce anything, and that's the point of research. You do actually have to complete this and come to a conclusion. And you do also have to have a timeline, uh, because otherwise you'll just keep going around forever. So what is it that we do when we complete? Uh, if you're asking a research question, you hope that what you find is then going to either change clinical practice or claim change medical care or change our fundamental understanding of how biology works. Uh, so what does that look like? It can look like a policy. It can look like uh, a, a patent. Uh, it can look like a protocol that you hope is going to be delivered in care. And, and it can and probably will at some point look like a manuscript because uh, manuscripts are one way that we disseminate the outcomes of research. And I think that the point I'd like to make here is that the question, what manuscripts would this research generate, is a question that comes right at the beginning. You should be imagining what the outcome of your research is going to be from the very start. Uh, and you keep imagining that as you go around and around the loop, but you do need to imagine what the uh, outcome of your research is going to look like uh, as a manuscript. So uh, why write a manuscript? Why do we write manuscripts? Uh, scientific manuscripts are the common and acceptable way of disseminating information. Uh, and you might say, well, that's just to the other scientific community, but these are uh, the people that you are interacting with, and these are the people you're collaborating with, and these are the people that you want to uh, see uh, your outcome and results. What about to the public? Uh, there are many ways of providing information to the public. Manuscripts more and more now are uh, publicly available, generally and broadly available. Uh, you can do media interviews, you can do television interviews. Uh, generally, the media is not interested in what you're doing unless they can make a catastrophic story about it. Uh, and uh, they are almost uh, uniformly going to pervert what you say into something that may not be quite as accurate as you might want it to be. Uh, so there's still a very important point uh, of publishing it as a manuscript. Uh, how else can your results be made available or make a difference? Uh, there's lots and lots of electronic ways of getting information out there now, but the scientific uh, and uh, biomedical community and the scientific community of all sorts goes back and reads manuscripts. So it's important to publish. It's also a very uh, frequently used 
measure of productivity. So as a, a researcher, your productivity will be evaluated on your publications. That's unavoidable. Uh, and it's not just about whether you publish, uh, but what and where you publish. Uh, and this is constantly measured. Having lots of papers is not necessarily a measure of quality. So quantity is not always uh, the name of the game. So I'm um, actually, each of these slides has, uh, has one of the publications that has come out of my laboratory, just to show you one of my favourite parts of biomedical science, and that is how beautiful it is, as it really is um, tremendously beautiful and wonderful and exciting to work in, in cell and molecular biology. So uh, quality versus quantity. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about this uh, because there are different metrics that are used here that you might not have come across. Some of you will have. Uh, measures of personal quality. Uh, if someone is looking at a, a, your CV and asking, is this person a good scientist, they will look at a number of things. And one of these is the number of citations. So what does this mean? Uh, the number of citations that, that, that you have is actually the number of times somebody else read your paper and was interested enough in it to cite it in their, in their work. So it's every time someone else cites your paper, that's a citation of your uh, publication. Uh, and so each article that you publish will have a total number of citations and that changes with time. Anyone new cites that it gets a new site. Uh, and you as an author will have an overall number of citations, so the cumulative total of all the citations for all the things that you've written. Um, and that's one way that you will be assessed, have you got a good number of citations. Uh, there is a term that's frequently more and more frequently used. It's actually a relatively recent um, way of looking at a person's quality. It's called the H-index uh, after uh, this guy, Jorge Hirsch, in 2005, who decided that one way of measuring someone's quality was to actually look at the, an index, uh, which is uh, the papers, the, the, the number of papers that have at least uh, H citations, so X papers with X citations. So if you have 50 manuscripts, maybe you've published 200 manuscripts, if you have 50, and at least 50 of those have 50 citations, uh, then your H index is 50. Uh, and so it's really a measure of saying, of the publications you've published, how many of them are being cited. It's a number, all of these things are metrics. Uh, and the other thing that is taken into account when people look at your uh, publications is your authorship position. And you might find this a bit strange, but people will look at whether you're the first person on the authorship list uh, the last person on the authorship list or somewhere somewhere vaguely in the middle, um, and that does make uh, a difference. Generally, the first person is the person who drove most of the work, uh, potentially did most of the work and probably wrote most of the text. Uh, so they are the driving person usually in a manuscript. Uh, and the senior person is uh, involved in the initial planning, background research and frequently the supervision, uh, and they are... Uh, in terms of seniority, as you move through your career, you want to be moving from first to senior author in your publications. Uh, and the journal um, uh, matters. So the journal in which your research is public, published is also an indicator of the quality of that research, and we'll come back to that a little bit. It does depend upon the journal's impact factor. That's a measure that they use of the visibility of that journal. So what is impact factor? Uh, it's the a quantitative measure of whether the journal that you're publishing in uh, is of high quality. Uh, and it's really a, a calculation of the average number of times articles from this journal published in the past two years have been cited. So it's really asking how many sites am I likely to get if my paper is published in this journal? And people will look at your, at your CV and say, well, they're publishing in Nature. Nature has an impact factor of uh, well over 30, so that's actually high, uh, or they're publishing in the uh, Indian Journal of, of Ophthalmology, which probably doesn't have an impact factor. So they'll, they'll actually judge whether it's a high-quality paper or a, uh, a local journal with low impact factor. So it's a proxy for relative importance. Uh, and the other uh, metric that is sometimes used, but it, it raises a point that I'd like to make, and that is the cited half-life. This is the median age of the, age of the articles that were cited uh, each year. When you write a paper and it's published, and sometimes the journal might take six months to get that published, and sometimes they'll put it online quickly, people have to read it, they have to think about it, they have to write something of their own, 
that might cite that, pa cite that paper, and then you'll get a cite for your paper. So if your article is public published here, it'll take some time before anyone reads it and cites it. And then there'll probably be a peak of citations and then it will become passé or someone will find something more interesting and people will stop reading that paper or citing that paper. And so every manuscript has a half-life. And some journals have longer half-lives. In other words, the papers that are published in those journals are cited for a longer period of time. It's not always correlated with impact factor, but frequently is. All right, so what does a manuscript look like? Uh, I asked uh, before who the audience was, but how many people here understand what a manuscript looked like. You've all read a manuscript? Everyone. Okay. So you could pretty much describe most journal articles or uh, manuscripts as, as having a structure like this. So a title, an abstract, and this is the generally 200 to 250 word summary that you can get on PubMed very quickly that will give you a quick snapshot of what that uh, study did and what they concluded. It's going to have an introduction in which you've got to lay the scene to the, to the current state of knowledge when you started the research and then pose the question uh, so that the reader actually knows why you were doing what you were doing. Uh, you've got your methods, sometimes that's at the end, but the methods is the detailed description of what you actually did, including the statistics. Uh, the results, which is essentially the data that you generated in your research study uh, and uh, the figures uh, will show you, uh, will reflect uh, the results. So you'll be referring to figures of data uh, from your results section. You'll come to a conclusion within, we'll have a discussion about what your results say and a conclusion. It's generally not a separate section, but it's part of your discussion. And uh, aside from the figures and tables, there'll be some references. So they, they're all pretty much uh, this type of structure. Uh, but they do vary enormously. Uh, and that, that variation varies with journal. Uh, and it also there, there are also different manuscript types. So uh, you, you need to actually look at the journal you're intending to publish in and ask what types of publications does this journal uh, actually print? Uh, and a full article is the sort of thing we just described, a full research article, but some manuscripts have what we call short communications. This is essentially also a full research project but it's very compressed in, in time, in word length and figure length. So uh, journals such as Nature and Cell, uh, not Cell, Nature and uh, Science have these much shorter short communications. That's a majority of their uh, feature articles are short communications. So you've got to pack all of your background results and conclusions uh, in a, a very truncated version of about 1,500 words. There's also review articles, and often these are invited. So uh, as you go through your career, you may get asked to review an area by a journal, and uh, then you'll actually be reviewing other people's literature and coming to, coming to a summary for the field. There are commentaries in, in the front of journals like, news and, uh, like Nature. You'll see things called News and Views. These are commentaries where if, they, if the journal believes they've got a great paper there, they'll ask another author to actually write a commentary highlighting that piece of research. Uh, there's protocol and data set type uh, manuscripts. In certain journals, they will publish a, a manuscript about the development of a new protocol that doesn't necessarily ask a, a research question, but is saying, I've developed a way of analyzing this particular type of data another way. Uh, and there's also letters to the editor, and these, these tend to be unsolicited comments about somebody else's. Um, it's not something I've ever done, and I don't know how strongly I'd suggest that you spend your life writing unsolicited comments about other people's research, particularly if you haven't done your own, so probably not a good plan. Um, so we're really going to focus on full articles, because full articles and, and research uh, short communications is what you really need to be uh, generating as a, as a cl uh, clinician scientist. Coming back to the types of journals again, we kind of broadly group them into the very high profile general journals, uh, which generally you wouldn't put them in that category unless they have an impact factor greater than 10. So you're looking at Cell, which is probably the most highly, uh, highest impact factor, most highly cited uh, journal. Uh, Science, Nature, uh, Lancet, New England Journal, PNS is a bit borderline. These are all publishing uh, and I've put them together not just because they're impact factor, but these are publishing to broad audiences. So they're not just um, gastroenterologists or nephrologists or 
uh, physicists. They, these are extremely eclectic journals that are publishing to a wide community generally. Uh, and so quite often the style in which you need to write for these types of journals, particularly the, the uh, short communication journals like uh, Science and Nature, is a completely different style of writing. Uh, if you read one of those manuscripts, you'll see it's very conversational. Uh, it's uh, very trimmed down. Uh, you have to be able to summarise what you've done for someone who's not an expert in your field and is not completely across all of the background literature in your field. The specialist journals, still really good journals, uh, often are uh, impact factor higher than nine, but sometimes lower. And you, you'll see now that uh, these types of journals are the sort of journals that, that I also publish in, and they're biased around kidney, because that's what I work on, things like Kidney, kidney International, the Journal of the American Society for Nephrology. And then you get down into subspecialty journals that are, are lower impact, and then uh, the local society bulletins, minor journals, often not in, in PubMed. And I'd really uh, point this out, it's very important nowadays, uh, the whole concept of uh, whether it's in a high impact factor uh, journal matters much, much less. What absolutely matters is that people can find it. And if your work is not in a, manus in a journal that is uh, being visibly searchable by PubMed, you're gonna be missed. Uh, it needs to be on PubMed. So if you are writing for a journal like this, particularly uh, uh, Science or Nature, frequently it's uh, short communication, so it's really a, a restricted number of words. The audience is wide, so you have to write with an understanding of who your audience is. You cannot assume uh, that they understand their background, and the format is very different. It has a minimal introduction. Uh, generally, you've got to fit pretty much everything into your abstract and then move straight into what you did. There's very tight word and figure limits. The title is absolutely critical and you must get to the point very quickly. So this style of writing is much more like writing a, a, a newspaper article. When a journalist writes a newspaper article, they get to the point first and then they go back and give you some background and then conclude. And these journals, are, are, are all, these manuscripts are always written that way. You have to get to the point of what you found first and then uh, fill in the details. In contrast, uh, these types of journals uh, tend to be more of the fairly conventional format. The format is longer. Uh, it's a full research article. The audience who's reading it is more likely to have uh, an understanding of the background of your field. You can go into uh, perhaps slightly more jargon and slightly more assumptions of, of knowledge. Uh, it'll have a longer abstract, a much bigger capacity to put information in introduction. So understand what the journal type is and therefore what the uh, article types are that you're writing for. Uh, and that comes into who is your audience. So everybody wants to get into the best journal. So how, how do I get uh, into the best journals? Um, I'd start off, uh, as pointed out in the last uh, talk, that you've really got to read a lot. You've got to know what you're, you're aiming for. And this takes time and it takes experience. You really must read your field to have any real idea of whether what you're contributing is, is going to be high impact or not is going to be uh, an important thing to publish. Uh, and one approach is actually to look for the ideal paper. Uh, if you are reading a lot in really high quality journals, you might see something, it may not be working in the particular field you like, but you may see a paper that you feel has done an incredibly good job in terms of the way in which they have developed their, their plan or their uh, logic and uh, presented their data and the elements that they've got in their paper. You can use that as your ideal paper uh, around which you model uh, what you're going to build and you can keep coming back to it and say, well, I can see that this paper got in because they went this one step further or they added this one thing. I would really need to do that if I wanted to get up into the highest impact journal. So find your ideal paper and that does require you to read a lot and to learn how to look at what you read and uh, in a sceptical way uh, and actually begin to judge yourself whether you think what they're telling you is, is solid uh, and believable. You do have to ask a challenging question. You essentially do not get into the best journals by doing the same thing as someone else and incre incrementally improving. That is not the way you get the highest impact journals. Uh, and uh, so you really always got to be asking in your field, whether you're in intensive care or in nephrology or in uh, respiratory or in physiotherapy or whatever it is, 
uh, what's going to make a difference. And as clinicians, you're ideally placed to do this because you're actually working with the clinician, with the patients, and you're actually working in your specialty area. And you should be able to say what would make a difference here. What is the main problem that my patients are facing? What will make a difference? Um, I would also agree that uh, it is very difficult to shift the paradigm uh, from very uh, strongly felt beliefs, uh, but paradigm busting is really what you've got to be about. And the other thing I didn't put up here, but it was, in, uh, it, it was pointed out to me again in the last talk, is the, the stuff that really gets into the best journals is the stuff that uh, changes beliefs, uh, changes an evidence base. It's the paradigm busting stuff. Okay, there's a lot of other things. You really have to understand your hypothesis. We, this is a very kind of scientific term. You need to know what you think uh, might be the answer to your question. That's your hypothesis. I think that this might be the case. Uh, and so you've really got to understand that. You've got to un understand that in the context of all of the background information that's already been published. And that requires you to know the field. And to know the field, you need, to, you need the experience and, and the immersion in that research uh, to actually have enough time to actually know what all, all the uh, background story is. Um, if you want to get your stuff published in a high impact journal, understand that you've really got to do comprehensive, high quality work where you've got complete data supporting your hypothesis. You can't just stop and say, okay, well, that's good enough. I'm, I'm almost there. You need to write in a style appropriate to the audience and that changes with journal. And you need to be fastidious about your presentation quality. You really have to be careful about presenting the best uh, quality work that you can when you submit that paper. Never overstate your findings. You will not convince a reviewer that uh, what you've got is great by overstating your findings. They actually will look at what you've got and say, uh, do I believe you or not? And have somebody else read what you've written and take advice. Read the instructions really carefully and th these journals have uh, endless instructions to their authors. So what is the journal really interested in publishing? What style of article are they looking for? And this is an interesting one. Who's on the editorial board? If you can actually go and look who's on the editorial board of your journal, if you can't recognise any of those people, if you don't think that it, you don't recognise them as being associated with your field in any way, you might think, well, perhaps that's actually not a journal that's going to be interested in what I'm doing. Uh, what manuscript formats will they accept? What are the components and structures and length? How often do they publish? Do they charge? And how long do they take to review? These are subsidiary questions, but they can start to become important. Uh, you could fi find that you want to publish in a particular journal and find that they only put out six issues a year. You're going to find it uh, pretty slow to get your stuff into the public light that way. Uh, they often do charge and sometimes they take quite a long time to review. These are subsidiary though. If it's a journal you want to be in, you go ahead. Okay, so where do I start? We've got all this that looks like a, a journal article, but how do I actually start writing it? Um, I'd suggest that actually the first thing you do is write, is, is prepare the figures in the table because that's actually, actually a great way of pulling together the data and saying, what actually have I got here? So that's where I would start. Uh, then you can write the methods. That's relatively easy because you should know that in detail because you've done the experimentation. Then take those uh, figures and write your results and the results should be referring to the figures as you go. Write your discussion next because that gives you a way of actually reflecting on what you've actually found. Then, then your conclusion. Uh, and then go back and write your introduction. So you've essentially got what you have done and then you're actually building back in an introduction so that when the reader reads it, they, you've actually now provided them enough background to understand what your edition has been. The last thing you write is the abstract. At least this is one view. I'm going to tell you another view in a minute. Uh, and then you need a, con a concise and dis con descriptive title, some keywords, and then the acknowledgements. Uh, and the references is something you're collecting as you go, and it's the last thing you, you do before submitting. Um, I actually do probably do a slightly different version of this. Um, I actually think it's quite helpful to write the abstract at the beginning and even draft a title. And I'd even go as far as saying you could do that uh, right at the very beginning, even, even when you start planning the project, because you'll rewrite it multiple times. You'll write, rewrite it constantly as you find that your hypothesis was wrong. 
uh, or that your data has actually given you a new hypothesis or you've changed direction in, in, this, in this cyclical planning process. You do need, once you've got to uh, uh, some outcomes, to agree on the conclusion because the conclusion affects your title uh, and it affects everything. You need to really clearly work out what your conclusion is and you do need to work out who your authors are. Research does not get done by one person. It will not be you that does this. It will be a group of people. And you need to know who's in your team from the very beginning. The team may grow, but you need to know who's contributing from the very beginning. Um, I'd be rewriting the abstract multiple times, right all the way through this process, and rewriting it again as the last thing you do, and reflecting again at the very end on whether the title you've got is the one that is the punchiest conclusion you can present for that study. And the other thing I would uh, remind you, at no matter what stage of your career, is that you have to edit and edit and edit and edit. And that's not just you, it's everybody. And if you do not go out and reread it and reread it and reread it, have someone else reread it and have a colleague reread it and give you advice, and, and if you do not accept that advice, you will not produce the best product that you could have produced. Um, a couple of things that are very dry. Who gets to be an author? There are actually clear guidelines that constitutes authorship. An author is defined as someone who contributed to the planning of the research, uh, the execution of the research, its analysis, interpretation of the data, and or the compilation of the manuscript. And if you cannot answer the question, uh, what did I do as an author, and have it fit into one of these three, then you're not an author. And that's the way you need to actually accept. Being the clinician of the patient in a study does not represent authorship. Make that very clear to this audience. And there are guidelines around this. Uh, and a comment on research uh, integrity and research ethics. Uh, there are very clear guidelines on uh, what's appropriate in research and uh, research integrity, which you can actually go and check online. And there is a code that does provide a framework for managing with breaches of research uh, ethics. I'll just list some of these, research misconduct, uh, the appropriate management of, of research data and materials, appropriate publishing and disseminating of research findings, and uh, a proper attribution of authorship, uh, appropriate peer review and management of conflicts of interest. So you, you really are in deep territory if you start uh, um, deviating from this. And just a comment on ethics. Uh, there are clear guidelines and ethical frameworks, uh, both for the conduct, and conduct of human research and animal research. So how do I get my key publications? Know what your supervisor has published and is publishing. If you don't know that, you really are in the dark. And ask if there's an opportunity to publish your literature, uh, your literature review as a review article. So if you're a, an honest student or a, a, a clinician doing a period of research that requires writing of a thesis, uh, you will do a lit review and these can be published. And if I look back um, early in my career, I actually uh, was a first author on Nature News and Views uh, why? Because it was actually contributed to by the stuff that I'd, I was reviewing and my, um, my supervisor allowed me to be involved in that process. Uh, similarly, this is an invited review uh, that's been cited many times that was really, that's really come out of just writing a lit review. Consider what aspects of your research project will be published and what your authorship role will be. You do want to be a first author. Uh, and plan your project. Within that plan, ask yourself, what is it going to look like when, it, when it's published? And you need to have these discussions up front and very openly. Right, now how am I going for time? Am I very over? So I've been asked by Ingrid to also give you a bit of an idea of the sort of research that, that I do and the sorts of ways uh, in which this has come together. And so uh, this is some of the research that's come out of my lab. And I, I want to focus on one particular set of work um, based on these images here, which is a paper that we published last year uh, in Nature. So my, I'm, a, I'm a developmental biologist, stem cell biologist, and um, this paper is called Kidney Organoids from Human IPS Cells Contain Multiple Lineages and Model Human Nephrogenesis. Essentially, this uh, project represents a culmination of seven years of work in my laboratory. Uh, so research outcomes do not necessarily come quickly. It involved collaborators all around the world. You can see there's quite a lot of authors here. Uh, it was a project that was incredibly risky from the very beginning, so we asked a very big question. Uh, and, and it was certainly, uh, it was not, what, it was not the first, but will be the best. 
Oh, I see. I remember what I'm saying here. We, we actually showed in this paper, as you'll see in a minute, that you can actually take a stem cell and regrow a kidney. Uh, now, there have, been subsequent, uh, there have been subsequent papers to that and there were early pa earlier papers than ours that suggested this might be possible. So we were not the first, but we will be the best uh, because we, our protocol is actually, we took the time to do this very carefully and validate what we're doing and that's very important. Uh, okay, so a little bit about uh, what I do. Uh, I work on the kidney and most of you probably know that you have two kidneys. Most of you will have two kidneys and you probably know that they produce urine on a daily basis. They actually do a lot of other things. They're really incredibly important. Uh, your kidneys actually regulate your blood pressure, your, your fluid balance, uh, your bone density, your red cell count. So there's really a lot of roles uh, that the kidney plays, not just filtering your blood and removing wastes. Uh, and the functional unit of the kidney is this uh, very convoluted and beautifully structured epithelial tube here called a nephron. You can see the vasculature comes in and there's a, a capillary bed here in what we call glomerulus. And this is where under pressure the blood is filtered and the urinary filtrate passes down here. That's a proximal tubule through a loop of hemli, a distal tubule and out through this plumbing which is a collecting duct which is eventually going to have your urine going down a ureter into the bladder and then out. So you have a million of these in each of your kidneys and that's surrounded by a very complex vasculature and a lot of interstitial cells that hold it all together. It's a remarkable structure. It's probably the most cellularly diverse organ uh, in your body uh, and you can't live without them. But that organ was actually formed during development uh, from, a, from a much smaller number of cell types and these, uh, this blue branching structure, very beautiful branching structure here, is the plumbing. It's the collecting duct network of the kidney. And this actually forms uh, from a little bud that grows in and then branches and branches and branches until it makes this very um, beautiful tree uh, within the organ. That actually isn't the nephron, that's just the plumbing. And around uh, each of these uh, tips as that branch comes in and branches and branches and branches to form the kidney as it's growing during embryogenesis is a, this cloud of cells we call the cap mesenchyme. Uh, strangely, I've shown it in green here but in red here. So this, this kidney here is actually, rot the rotating one is actually the same age as the tree that I showed you bus just before. And so these cells out here that sit around in this cap, these are the cells that during development are a mesenchyme but they will become epithelium and form the nephrons. And so all of your million nephrons are actually formed from this stem cell population or nephron progenitor population in the kidney. We've spent 20 years looking at this in, in animals like the mouse. Uh, and here's the branch that comes in and starts to branch and branch and branch within this area of mesenchyme. Uh, and what you see is this uh, cap right out around each of the tips. That's that cap mesenchyme or nephron progenitor population. This tree doesn't branch unless this population exists because this population is instructing the tip to branch. Uh, and the branching tip keeps that cap alive and it also helps instruct that cap so that gradually cells within the cap commit to becoming an epithelium here and this little ball of cells is actually the birth of one nephron. Uh, and so every time you branch, you make more of these and you get more and more branches and you get more and more nephrons. And that's great, it's wonderful uh, that it, it works so efficiently. Uh, here again is a, a tip coming in, uh, and here you can see in pink that cat mesenchyme marked by this gene here, 62, and here's a nephron that's just formed. And that goes on all the way through development in humans until about 38 weeks of gestation in mouse until birth. And then this population here of nephron progenitors is lost. Uh, it completely commits to forming nephrons uh, and there is no evidence in humans or any other mammal uh, that if you lose a nephron uh, as an adult, that there is any capacity to grow a new one. So having worked on this population, what it can do, how it gets there, what genes control that process, uh, the realisation that it's not there in the adult kidney uh, took us back to this question. So our research question was, can we recreate these cell types for renal regeneration and we were focusing on this population here and so we went in with a hypothesis that if we could recapitulate development in a dish we would be able to get back to that population and that population would make nephrons. 
So how do you do this? Let's go backwards a step. Your kidneys is one organ, you have many organs. Uh, and if you follow back through embryology, uh, this is a little embryo going backwards, the kidney is, uh, is a mesodermal organ uh, and it arises from this uh, little green branch that grows out at the side and the branches here, uh, which is called the ureteric bud, and this orange mesenchyme. And they in turn come from this block of trunk mesoderm as the embryo elongates, called the intermediate mesoderm, which in turn is actually coming from a, a portion of the embryo very early on called the the primitive streak, which is the point at which we start to make endoderm and mesoderm. So we can map all this back based on embryology, and we can say, well, obviously, if we had a stem cell in a dish, we would want it to go through all of those steps to make a kidney rather than a heart or a liver or a brain. And we can walk through this process and say, if I start it with the inner cell mass of an embryo, which, which makes this pluripotency gene OCT4, if we wanted to make a kidney, we would need to make posterior primitive streak. We'd then need to make intermediate mesoderm, and we'd then need to make this metanephric mesenchyme and neuroteric epithelium. Uh, and so we did this using what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And uh, this has really only been possible since 2007, uh, when Shinya Yamanaka showed that you could actually take any adult cell. We've got a fibroblast here, and we do do it with skin, but you can do it with any cell. And if you force the expression of key transcription factors, so key genes, you can actually take those cells backwards to what we call an induced pluripotent state. So a pluripotent cell uh, is equivalent to the inner cell mass of the embryo and has an ability to form any tissue. So we can go from a cell that is what we would have called 30 years ago terminally differentiated into skin and actually change its, uh, its genetic activity back into a state where it believes it's in an early embryo. Uh, and that's great because from an induced pluripotent cell, we can draw these endless diagrams of which there's probably 10 billion published now that say, well, we'll just take the induced pluripotent stem cell and we'll turn it into whatever we like. In fact, this is actually very difficult. Um, however, we're getting better, better at it. And in the last couple of years, a number of amazing papers have come out, one in which uh, uh, Sasai in Japan actually showed that by growing these stout cells in a particular way in a dish, this is what we call an embryoid body, and giving it certain growth factors across time, what they could actually form was an optic cup. So this is essentially an eye growing in a dish that's the back of the retinal forming. Uh, and this is work from Madeleine Lancaster where she actually grew uh, a patterning uh, brain organoid. So this is human cells turn into what looks like uh, a developing human brain. Uh, and we call these organoids, so what we're not doing is making one cell type in a dish, we're making essentially a little patterning structure. And that's not so surprising because that's what the embryo does. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was do this for the kidney. Uh, and to cut a long story very short, uh, over that seven years we developed a protocol where we could take uh, either embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent cells and essentially across a period of about three weeks we, we, we change the environment in the dish by changing the growth factors and also the way in which the cultures are grown. And we walk it through the steps of, of development that we expect to see until we actually reach this day here, where we get this structure we call a self-organizing kidney. Uh, it's not gonna play for me. This is actually looking through one of these organoids. So here's your yellow collecting duct branching, connecting up to the nephron epithelium here, and then all these balls are the forming glomeruli. And so we, what we got in a dish essentially was a little model of a developing human kidney. Uh, and it had nephrons in it. Those nephrons are starting to segment into the different segments of the nephron that you need for function. Uh, and it's actually starting to make glomeruli. Uh, and if you look at the whole structure, this is about five millimetres across, so it's, you can easily see it with the naked eye. Uh, all of these are glomeruli in purple and all this radiating green stuff is actually the blood vessels. So when, what, we, while we, what we wanted was nephrons. We got nephrons with an associated vasculature starting to form, uh, perivascular cells that will surround the vasculature. Uh, and uh, we also got interstitium, renally patterned interstitium. So in fact, these organs make uh, at least 
uh, eight or nine different cell types uh, in an arrangement that's very reminiscent of a developing human kidney, uh, and they pattern them and differentiate them and segment them in a very similar way to what would have happened in an embryo. So uh, we wanted to ask, do the cells within the organoid begin to show cellular function? So are they actually working? Uh, and what you're looking at here is where we've taken one of these organoids and these uh, tubular structures here are the forming proximal tubules. The proximal tubules are extremely sensitive to toxins. And so what we've given uh, the, the cultures is a cisplatin, which is a chemotherapeutic agent which does cause toxic injury to the kidney, and shown that these little green spots start to appear in those proximal tubules uh, in a dose-responsive way, which is a very specific response of proximal tubules to cisplatin injury. Uh, we could get a little overexcited about this, and so we wanted in a very unbiased way to say, are we sure that this is human fetal kidney? Uh, and so we actually took uh, these organoids and made uh, total RNA out of all of them to look at all of the genes that are expressed. So we're essentially asking what genes are expressed in this and does it look like human kidney? Uh, and we compared it to a data set with about 25 different human fetal tissues from either trimester one or trimester two and asked bioinformatically, what does a kidney organoid in a dish look like? Uh, and it looks like a trimester one human kidney, uh, which is pretty exciting to us. Uh, the second most similar tissue is trimester two human kidney. Um, so it's not a tongue or a gonad or a liver or a heart or a brain, it is actually a kidney. So uh, I guess what this paper showed is that you can take pluripotent stem cells, be they uh, embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, and the first time, for the first time we could actually walk it through to this very complex self-organising kidney structure. It has more than nine distinct cell types, has evidence of nephron patterning, it's got surrounding vasculature and stroma, it matches a uh, human kidney, and it responds appropriately to nephrotoxins. Um, now, that, that was heralded as being a very exciting uh, breakthrough and we're very pleased to see a pretty picture on, on the front of nature. Uh, but essentially if you ask what am I going to do with this as a clinician, at the moment you're not going to do much because uh, really we actually just move from here to here. We showed how you can actually take an in induced stem cell, induced pluripotent stem cell and start to make kidney tissue. Uh, if you actually then want to go and do disease modelling or drug screening or actually engineer a whole organ to replace uh, the kidney or use cells from these to go back into a patient, there's a huge amount of research that still needs to be done. Uh, but this was the breakthrough that actually is going to allow a lot of that to proceed. Very excitingly, uh, because you can use induced pluripotent stem cells, this means that we can make those stem cells from, from a patient uh, and we are actually making induced pluripotent stem cells from patients. Uh, and indeed, now uh, the use of gene editing technology is advancing so quickly that we can take a, a fibroblast from a patient who in my case, uh, we're working on this at the moment, has a, a mutation in a gene that means that child is born with a, uh, a, a kidney defect that will put them into renal failure in the first few years of life. We can actually make a stem cell and use a CRISPR editing to fix that mutation uh, and then actually use cells from the patient themselves to model both a normal and a diseased kidney in the dish. In this way, we hope we can actually develop not just a better understanding of their disease, but potentially also new treatments that might be personalizable for that patient. We're also working with a company to work on uh, using these little, in, these little organoids in a dish, no bigger than they are now, to actually screen drugs to see if they're nephrotoxic uh, before we re re reach clinical trial. This has been a major problem for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and we're actually working on the biggies, which are certainly the ones that the clinicians and the patients want, and that is can you use this protocol and scale it up and uh, pattern it appropriately to actually bioengineer a replacement tissue or actually develop a cellular therapy for the treatment of chronic kidney disease. So I'm going to stop there. This is actually Minori Takasato who is the postdoc in the lab who really drove this project. Uh, and as I said, it was a very uh, long project with a very ambitious uh, aim. Um, and I think the lessons learned uh, was that we worked from a point of strength. This breakthrough was actually something that rested on 20 years of research into understanding how the kidney normally develops. And without that background information, we couldn't have actually even started this project. Uh, you certainly do... Um, 
know what you need to know what you want to achieve and we essentially went in there saying we want to be able to make kidney out of stem cells we aimed high i don't think you could have aimed much higher um, know what you will, uh, you will make know what will make good into excellent and this was a really key issue for us we could have published at various points in time uh, we could have published at various points in time during that seven years and got poorer outcomes. We could have had intermediate manuscripts, we could have had intermediate outcomes, and that may have been great in terms of number of manuscript, but it would not have been good in terms of the quality of the outcome. Uh, so we really focused on getting to the end and publishing high quality work. Uh, you have to be prepared to work hard, and this was an incredibly difficult project where a lot of people worked very hard. Uh, and the other is not to panic. Um, as long as you're solid and you keep working towards an outcome, uh, you'll succeed. And I'm going to finish there. Uh, I have many, many people who've worked with me over many, many years, and it's incredibly important to emphasise the fact that uh, you're only as good as the team around you. Uh, and I thank all of them for their contributions, and I'd really encourage you uh, to spread your wings and see what, what questions you want to ask and what, where you want to go in your research. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Melissa. Breathtaking research, and thanks for the really useful overview about how to get it published. Are there any questions uh, in the audience? Yes, at the back. Yeah, Luigi, I think that is. I can see you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you have any advice on how we can manage the politics of authorship. I mean, and it's probably just about having the conversation, but when things get tricky, do you have any tips? It is about having the conversation, and I'd start having that conversation early. Um, it's a tricky thing to negotiate, but uh, it's always best done if you, if you do it openly. Uh, and time and time again, you can come back to the definition of authorship and... The journals are now moving to a point where they will say, tell me what the authorship role was of every person on your paper. Um, and then you've got to write it down. Uh, if you can't write it down, then you're not an author. Great advice. Any, any other questions from the... Yes. I've just got a microphone coming to you. Uh, congratulations on your research. It's Thanks. fantastic. Um, my question is just in regards to the ethics of being able to regenerate kidneys yep. and other organs, I guess, in the future. Um, I'm interested to get your perspective on where we should stop. So obviously, um, when there's a diseased kidney, um, like congenital or something like that, that would be great to, to be able to replace that. But in terms of um, chronic diseases that have stemmed from poor management of one's own health, um, should we be using this science for those sorts of things and where, where does our, where's your position on that? Uh, if you're a nephrologist uh, and had a patient that had uh, uh, obesity and diabetes and was going into uh, renal sclerosis, end stage rent kidney disease as a result of those diseases, would, would you prevent them from transplantation because they weren't very good about sticking to their diet? I mean, we actually do transplant all the time into people in which we know their inherent disease, whether it's immunological or, or, um, or even diet-related, uh, is going to injure the organ that we move in there. Uh, I think we're so far away from actually being able to develop a better approach um, for the kidney that uh, I don't think I think there's an ethical issue around this at all at the moment. Perhaps one day we'll reach the, the point, though, where we're all discussing as a society... Um, a bit more seriously about euthanasia and when we do stop treating patients. Mm -hmm. That's a very different ethical question. I'm glad it was you answering that question. I was just thinking about socioeconomic determinants of health and health behaviour, though. I mean, sometimes people have those diseases because of where they're unfortunate enough to be, to be born. And you can take it even further back ethically, I think. That's a great question. Um, yes, another question over... Sorry, I didn't see you. That's all right. Um, my question's about... Um, you've mentioned how many people have been involved and it's been obviously a very long journey. Uh, in that journey, you've had postdocs and colleagues, but um, could you just give us an idea of how maybe you might have recruited, say, PhD students or honours students or what roles they might have played in the journey? Yes, um, th this was an interesting project in that uh, there was only one um, PhD student involved in this 
um, because it was such a risky project, and it really was a risky project. Uh, and so it wasn't something that I was going to put an honours student or a PhD student on early. Um, at the moment, we have three PhD students that are working on, uh, on this work and, and carrying it forward, uh, including, including Tom, who's in the audience, uh, who's a clinician researcher. Um, in terms of engaging my students and uh, particularly honours students, and I know some of you are, have done undergrad science and done honours, uh, you, you really, it's one, it, I, I would say as a, as a female in scientist, one of the most important decisions you can make is who you marry, seriously, because if they're not going to support you through your career, you're in trouble. And I think one of the most serious decisions you can make if you want to move into research is, is who your supervisor is. That supervisor must be interested in your career uh, or you are in trouble. Uh, and as a supervisor, you need to be thinking, am I giving this honest student a project that's reasonable to produce outcomes from? And what will those outcomes look like? And what's their backup plan? And it's the same with a PhD student. And I want to see my PhD students coming out with first order publications. Otherwise, I'm failing. So thank you very much again, Melissa. Will just uh, join me in thanking her for that incredible presentation. <laughs> So um, we will go slightly over into afternoon tea um, time, but we'll give you plenty of time for afternoon tea. And it's an enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Ewan Wallace, who I'm privileged enough to work with at Monash Health and Monash University, where he's the chair of obstetrics and gynaecology at Monash University and the head of the obstetric service at Monash Health. He's the lead in uh, perinatal research at the Ritchie Centre in the Hudson Institute. And he's an incredible storyteller because he graduated from Edinburgh University. Uh, and I have been quoted as saying that I'd be prepared to pay a lot of money uh, to see Ewan give a talk like this, which I've heard him give before. Um, and it's fantastic that he's here. No pressure. Uh, but he's here to, to tell you how to give a great talk. So thanks, Ewan. Thank you. So at um, events like this, it's customary to uh, thank the organisers for inviting you to participate. And when I was reflecting on giving this talk, I was thinking, what sort of person would agree to give a talk on how to give a great talk? Um, either an idiot um, or someone who was overconfident. Now, those of you who know graduates of Edinburgh Medical School know we're very self-effacing people. We are the, it is the world's best medical school, but nonetheless, we are very self-effacing people. So. Um, I do thank Eddie and Ingrid for the invitation, um, but I think I form the, I'm a member of the former category. I'm an idiot to agree to give a talk on how to give a great talk, but let's give it a go. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set some principles first, some ideas, some philosophies, and, and these are personal principles and personal philosophies, but actually I think you've seen some of these principles played out in all of the talks you've heard already today. And then I'm going to give you some much more grounded practicality. So as you write a talk, um, it might be your first talk, it might be your 10th or your 100th talk, then here are some practicalities that, are, that we use, I use personally, and we use in our own lab to, we think, deliver um, better talks, if, if not great talks, at least better talks. So why do we talk at all? Why, why do we present our work at all? Well, it, it's all about sharing our ideas our findings, you just heard the most amazing work on transforming IPS um, cells into kidneys, into whole functioning kidneys. So why, why we talk at all is we want to share our ideas. And, I, and I'll actually put it to you that, that you know, while you can maybe be able to create IPS cells into kidneys, unless you tell people, then it's a worthless piece of work. So unless you publish it, and you've just heard a brilliant talk on how to publish, unless you publish it, unless you share those ideas at meetings, um, then you haven't completed your task. And so it's about learning to communicate. And in the same way that the laboratory techniques or the clinical techniques or the surgical techniques um, or clinical trials techniques that you learn, we need to learn how to communicate. We need to learn how to write properly and we need to learn how to um, present properly. And actually, I think the key, the first key to communicating well is actually understanding 
what your audience's needs are. And I'll come back to this, that one of the key things is knowing who your audience was. So the talk that Ronaldo gave us um, would have been a very different talk had it not been pitched primarily at medical students and young clinician scientists. If he'd been pitching that at professors, it would have been a very, very different talk. So you need to know what your needs are. And he, this, this uh, um, Stephen is a, is a writer on effective communication. I actually, long before that, my wife, um, who's a um, science graduate but moved into the pharmaceutical industry, she used to sell drugs to GPs, told me many years ago, 30 years ago, that actually to be a good communicator, you first need to be a good listener. And um, I used to send her, set, set her, she used to sell ACE inhibitors. I used to set her challenges. Every month she got a printout of the ACE inhibiting prescribing practices of her GPs in her sector. And, and I'd say, look, that GP's not prescribing any of your, any of your drug. I, I bet you in six months time, you can't get him to prescribe drugs, your, your drug. Well, six months' time, he's only prescribing her ACE inhibitor. He's not prescribing anyone else's. So if you believe that you're not influenced by the drug industry, you're an idiot because they wouldn't be spending millions of dollars on their sales forces um, unless they think they could change your practice. Do they change the practice? Of course they do. And they change the practice because their sales force are good listeners and good communicators. That's what we need to be. Essentially, all we're doing is telling a story. Um, it's, this is the 50th anniversary of Play School in Australia. And ABC, quite rightly, are celebrating that through a number of events across the year. And there have been a parade of celebrities who have, who have related how they enjoyed Play School as a young child. They enjoyed the stories. We still enjoy stories. We are no different um, today than we were when we were five or six or seven. We all intrinsically love stories. The human being is a storytelling, story-sharing species. And communicating through talks, we are just telling a story. Put in another way, the universe is not made of atoms. It's just made of tiny stories. Now, that's not to belittle our science, except to say the science is useless unless you can share it, um, because it's through sharing it that it can be applied. So, much like scientific writing, scientific storytelling, it, it's a tug of war. There's a tension between the precision that you want to relate to your audience. These are the things that we did. They were very clever things. Um, only we could do them. Um, so there's a precision, a scientific precision about it. And there's a tension between the storytelling. And the art, the real skill of giving a great talk um, is about getting that balance right, engaging your audience by telling a story while delivering the messages that you want them to hear and learn about the precision of your science. So it's a balance between clarity and precision and engagement. So I want to give you an example. I want to tell you a story about this individual. I ask our BMed Sci students at Monash when, uh, when I give them a talk on um, how to write good science, I ask them who this is. No one ever gets it right. So that's an unfair question. Um, I won't ask you who he is, but I'll tell you who he is um, through a couple of pictures. Um, I will ask you um, what, what um, islands these are. Does anyone know what islands these are? Apart from any Monash students who've seen this slide before, um, does anyone know what islands these are? No. They are. They're Hawaiian islands. Um, and so who's this individual? We'll ask you who this individual is. Who's this? This is James Cook. Yeah, fairly important in the history of Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is Captain James Cook, and uh, James Cook was, he wasn't actually the first European, the Spanish or Portuguese probably landed in Hawaiian Islands before James Cook, but he was the first to, uh, to chart it. He was a great, as well as being a great sailor, he was of course um, an exemplary cartographer. He was the first to map uh, the Hawaiian Islands. He actually didn't call them Hawaiian Islands, though. Does anyone know what he called them, first of all? Well, he called them the Sandwich Islands. Um, why did he call them the Sandwich Islands? Well, he called them the Sandwich Islands because that's who this is. This is John Montague. He was the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Why did he call, why did Cook call the Hawaiian Islands the Sandwich Islands? Why did he name them after John Montague? Well, he named them after Montague because 
Montague was the first Lord of the Admiralty. That's a great title. Imagine having that in your business card, first Lord of the Admiralty. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty. In fact, he was first Lord on three occasions. And on one of those occasions, he was responsible for funding the second and third Pacific voyages of Cook. And it was on the second voyage that Cook mapped the Hawaiian Islands. And so in honour of um, the um, Earl of Sandwich, um, he named the Sandwich Islands after him. In fact, there are other Sandwich Islands. Uh, uh, there are, there's, a, there's a Montague Island named after John Montague in the South Sandwich Islands off the Antarctic. And um, in the Coral Sea off in far north Queensland, there's Hinchinbrook Island. And Hinchinbrook Island is named after John Montague's house, Hinchin, Hinchinbrook House, which is the family seat of the Sandwiches. So the uh, Montagues have got islands named all over the place because he funded Cook's um, original voyages in 1778, in the case of Hawaii in 1770, in the case of Hinchinbrook Island in far north Queensland. Now, of course, John Montague was famous for something else apart from the Sandwich Islands. Can you guess what he was famous for? Who was famous for? The sandwich. And the story goes that uh, not only was he the first Lord of the Admiralty, he was also an avid gambler. He'd fit well into Melbourne. He was an avid gambler. And um, he used to spend his days not in Westminster, but in his private club, gambling at the car table all day, every day. In fact, so avid a gambler was he that he hated leaving the gambling table to have lunch. Now, the, um, the menu of choice at that time, this is in the mid-1700s, the, the menu choice at that time was pickled beef and um, normally served with overboiled potatoes and ruined cabbage. Um, but rather than leaving the table, he asked his man to bring his pickled beef placed between two pieces of bread so he could hold his beef while he would continued playing cards. And other members of the club saw Sandwich do this and when, when asked about, um, sir, would sir like to retire for lunch? He said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll have some of that Sandwich stuff um, that the Earl was eating. And so the story goes, the Sandwich was born and named um, by John Montague because um, of his car table. Now, many of, uh, many of um, our colleagues will tell us that, that diet drives our genome or at least epigenetic changes of our genome. Um, but here's actually the 11th Earl of Sandwich and his son, soon to become the 12th. Um, and I suspect that the genome drives diet because clearly they're still eating sandwiches um, <laughs> like their ancestors um, over 200 years ago. Why did I tell you that story? Well, I could have told you the story like this. I could have given you a number of bullet points um, talking about John Montague telling us that he succeeded his grandfather as the Earl when he was 10, telling you about being the first Lord Ramonte, funding Cook, etc., etc. And the reason I've told you the story first in pictures is that it's a much more engaging manner and, and you're much more likely to remember it. And actually the talks that you've heard today have been full of pictures. But why is that? Well, if you put someone into a MRI and do a functional MRI on them and give them a piece of, of script to read, then you will activate um, only very limited components of their brain. If you, if you tell them a story and get them to imagine pictures, then you activate a whole um, different and larger successive components of the brain. There's actually a neurobiological basis for telling our stories with pictures. And we will much more likely remember the story than a list of bullet points. And so one of the overarching principles of philosophies, I think, is where possible, sell your science with pictures rather than words. So as we leave the principles and go to practicalities, it's really about just, just bear in mind that ultimately, while your science may be really clever and really complicated, you are selling a story. And so there are some things that you need to do to sell that story effectively, such that when your audience leaves the room, they will remember your science. Is that important? Well, shit, it's important because if they remember it, they're more likely to apply it. Or more importantly and selfishly, they're more likely to cite it. And as you've already heard, citations are really important when you're trying to get money. So 
Here are some practicalities now, uh, and I'm going to go, go through these four areas, planning your talks, making some slides, getting ready, and then the day that you give your talk. Um, so I've already uh, talked about this. Know your audience. And if you're not sure who the audience is, if someone invites you to give a talk at a meeting um, and you're not sure who the audience is, ask them. And quite often, particularly as you get increasingly successful, your work is more broadly known, quite often you'll be asked to give a talk to a society or an organisation that you're not a member of, um, of whose meetings you have never attended. And so ask them who, who actually is present in the audience. And so you can tailor your talk uh, to your audience. That's really important. You have to be able to talk in the language that your audience will understand. So you'll talk quite differently if it's a room full of nurses or physios than it would be if it's a room full of cell biologists. But the talk might be exactly the same. The content, you know, the actual topic might actually be the same. Be clear on the purpose of your talk. And one of the fun things as being clinician scientists is that you'll have opportunities to give all sorts of different types of talks, free communications at scientific meetings, and that's the basis of this talk today about how to give one of those. But you'll be asked to give, as a junior doctor, um, or as a training doctor, um, you'll be asked to give um, case presentations and grand rounds at hospitals, uh, teaching seminars to medical students, to peers, to um, colleagues, nursing colleagues, allied health, etc., etc. And in time, you'll be asked to give plenary lectures, almost review lectures of your own work and work of others at national, international meetings. Uh, who's this? Who's the, who, the picture? Who's the photograph? This is Agatha Christie. Now, why do I show a picture of Agatha Christie? Well, I show a picture of Agatha Christie because the structure of the talk will depend completely on what type of talk you're giving. So when you're giving a grand round presentation, the sole purpose of a grand round case type presentation is to make your colleagues in other units in your hospital look like idiots. There is no other purpose of a grand round. <laughs> And so typically in a grand round, you're presenting a case presentation of a very complex, very rare disorder. There's only one person in the whole of Australia has ever had it. Um, it took you 10 years to actually make the diagnosis. Um, but you're going to present it such that you made the diagnosis on day one. It's so simple. And you're going to, but you're going to, like Agatha Christie, you're going to withhold the key piece of diagnostic information until the very end. And so your audience is going to be, including your professors of medicine who in, in other units are going to be scratching your head thinking, I should know this, I should know this, I should know this, but I don't, I don't, I don't. And then you give them the last piece of information. You say, did you not? Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't understand. You didn't know that. <laughs> As Melissa has just told you, when you're presenting scientific discoveries, either in manuscripts um, or in talks, you give the information first and then you underpin it with, this is how we got there. Um, these are the lessons along the way. So completely the reverse. It's one of the reasons I hate Agatha Christie. Um, but my mother, and my mother, my wife loves Agatha Christie. I mean, loves Agatha. When, when um, David Suchet visited a couple, you know, last year, year before, she was in a queue. I think she was going to marry him if my daughter hadn't rescued him. <laughs> So, so when you're giving your talk, um, you need to decide on your key messages that you want to deliver. And sometimes there won't be time to deliver all the things, all the exciting things you've got to say. Um, so you have to choose um, carefully the things, the key messages you want your audience to take away. And you deliver those first. And actually, often you will reiterate them and deliver them last. So they leave the room with those key messages. One of the nice things, particularly if you're giving a slightly longer talk, a half hour talk or a 40 minute talk, is that you can take your audience on the journey with you. So you can give them new information um, early on in the talk that you will then use that new information to unlock another piece of new information later on. That's a really nice technique because without the information that you give them up front, they can't unlock and understand the next discovery. And so as you unlock that with them, with the piece of information you've given them just five or 10 minutes before, they feel really good about themselves because they're now using a piece of information that they didn't have 10 minutes before. So they've learned something. Not only have they learned it, they're now using it 
um, in the next step of as you unravel the story for them. They feel re that's a really warm and fuzzy feeling um, when that happens in a, in a, when you're listening to a talk. You feel really good about yourself as an audience member, and so you feel really warm towards the person who's giving the talk, so you feel really good about them. So they leave the room loving you. They'll, 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 they'll be tweeting furiously, you should have heard this woman talk, she did this, and such and such. So, so that's quite, quite a good technique. Um, you need to know how much time you have to talk. And you ask the organizers, does that include questions or the, is there round table questions at the end? And you need to tailor your talk to fit that time. Because if you don't, then you'll end up rushing um, or you'll end up being cut off by the chair, which is really embarrassing. And um, all sorts of horrible things happen. So um, be really careful. And if you've got a 20 minute talk that you need to deliver in 10 minutes, you re-replan re your 20 minute talk and you take out half the slides. So the rule we have in our lab, one slide per minute of talk. If you've got a 15 minute talk, it's 15 slides. Um, if it's 15 minutes with 12 minute talk and three minutes questions, it's 12 slides. And so I get my group to make a talk outline. Um, I, I, do, I do it on paper. Um, still, they do electronically, but here is a 15-minute talk, 12 minutes, three minutes of questions. Um, and you'll notice that the 12 slides include a title slide and an acknowledgement slide. So there are actually only 10 slides about the topic, a couple of background slides, an aims and hypothesis slide, a couple of method slides, some results slide, a summary slide. Now, that summary slide is going to leave your audience with the key things that you've already told them. And then a conclusion slide. What's that, what, how's that different from summary? Well, it's really about, it's really about applying your, uh, your findings, which are very precise, and, and extrapolating them. What, where, where might this go? But a bit like Melissa said, you're not over-exaggerating what you find. You find a very specific thing. But this might be the next step. Rather than saying, we found a cure for cancer, you're going to say, well, we, we found a drug that inhibits... Um, angiogenesis, neoangiogenesis, which may have applications in cancer therapy, for example. Um, when making, now, I, I've been sitting through all the talks um, so far, and, and I've been watching them very carefully, and thankfully they've um, subscribed to the rules I'm telling you, otherwise I'd have to you know, make, make some backpedaling. But um, when you keep your um, remember that your audience is only, to do, is only able to do one thing. Either they're able to read your slides, um, or they're able to listen to you talking. Well, actually, that's not strictly true. Women can do both, but men, <laughs> men can only do one or the other. So given that there's likely to be men in the audience, um, either they can read what you've written on the slide, or they can listen to you talking. They can't do both. And so if you have a slide, and it's rather tedious as you read the slide, so if, if you want them to listen to you, then you can't have lots of text on the slide, because they're going to be reading, reading that, and not listening to you. So the women in the audience have heard both. The men are still reading and haven't heard a word I've said for the last uh, 30 seconds. So how do you get around that? You just keep your slides simple and clean. Use a sans serif text like Helvetica or Arial um, and try and keep your text to single lines. The, the lines are not there to impart all the information. The lines are really there as an aid memoir to you. Oh yeah, I need to talk about keeping lines simple rather than having a whole body of text. So they're just there to remind you what to say. They're not there to, for the audience to read um, in great detail. Avoid too many colors. And unless you're, unless you're uh, Ronaldo or Melissa, avoid red. <laughs> and actually both Melissa and Ronaldo used red but actually they both use red on a white background, uh, which is okay. <laughs> it's not great, but it's okay. Um, but it, as you're writing talks to start with, I would just avoid the color red. Now look, I'm a member of the Australian Labour Party, I have nothing against the left of politics. It's just not a great color on slides for talks. So um, don't use red and try and keep your colors as few as possible. And I've said this already, rather than use text, use graphs and pictures um, to sell your story. And you've heard some great stories today. 
most of them sold optimally through pictures because we remember the pictures. Who, who will forget the pictures of the spinning kidney and all those beautiful colors, those microscopy colors of a developing kidney in the, la in the, in the, in the, in the Petri dish? Uh, difficult to impart that and remember that in text. <laughs> Be very sparing with animation and, um, and avoid vis a video, particularly when you're learning, avoid video unless absolutely essential. I have seen video go so wrong so often at meetings, it's, it, it's embarrassing. So of course, as you become uh, more skilled and more practiced, then you can begin to shed some of these rules and branch out and be risky. Um, but my advice um, is avoid video and, unless it's absolutely essential to your message. And um, even if you don't have a Scottish accent, you don't need video, I don't think. So I'm going to show you just one slide, work of ours, to demonstrate some of those um, principles. So this is a study that, uh, that Ryan Hodges, who's now head of parental services at Monash, did when he was a clinician, PhD student of mine. Essentially what he was asking was, does stem cells, could stem cells rescue a model of, it's a sheep model of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a, it's a preterm lung disease, a, a disease that preterm babies get of dysfunctional lung development. And what Ryan did was ventilated lambs in utero and then delivered stem cells. And what you're looking at are some, some um, microscopy slides of fetal lamb lungs. Uh, in the first column are control la lambs. The second column are lambs who are ventilated. And then the histo bars, uh, histographs are just markers of lung injury. So in pink are control lambs and in blue are injured lambs. And then what Ryan did was to give placental stem cells to the, excuse me, to the lambs and change the histology and change the markers of injury. Why am I showing you this figure? Well, I've done two things in this figure. The first thing I did was I chose to only give you control and injured lamb data first. Why? Because you're not listening to me when I'm talking. All you're doing is looking at my slide. And so I want to keep you focused that there's a difference between the injured la lamb and the control lamb. Because next I'm going to show you what the cells did to the lamb who would other, or otherwise have been injured. The other thing I've done is that the colors I've used remain the same um, for each of the four markers. So if you're a control lamb, you're pink. If you're an injured lamb, you're blue. And if you're an injured lamb who got cells, you're green. And so often you go to talks and the presenter flicks the control and, in, and experimental group colors around, such that you, you, in your mind, you think, oh, well, okay, the experimental group is blue, and then the next slide, the experimental group is pink. Um, so when you're presenting data, try and keep your groups colored um, the same throughout your talk, because then you can spend time on your first slide saying, okay, the control group is gonna be pink, the experiment, the Injured group's going to be blue, and the cell delivery group's going to be green. That's going to be the same for all the next few slides, so you can spend 30 seconds explaining the format, then the format's all going to be the same. So try and use animation specifically to um, hold attention, and um, only reveal information as you need to, and keep the data um, unif the colors uniform. And, and then lastly, um, some um, information about signposting. What do I mean by signposting? And, and again, as you become more experienced, you become less needy of signposting. But it's quite useful when you're first learning to put slides together um, and you'll have a slide that looks like this that will be peppered through your talk. So you'll say, here's the outline of my talk. These are things I'm going to talk about. And then as you move through your talk, this slide will appear every so often but highlighting the bit you're on. It reminds you where you are, also allows the audience to fall asleep and wake up and say, oh yeah, we're now on methods, I'll just go back to sleep again until he gets the results. <laughs> oh, he's at results now, I better wake up. Um, um, and you will, and, and it, it's a very safe um, structure to use when you're learning. You'll need it less and less the more experienced you become. And then I, and another thing that, of, that novices find useful is to, um, <coughs> is to give a summary to the audience, this is what I'm gonna say, and then at the end, this is what I've said. Uh, and again, it, 
it gives the audience some structure, it gives you some structure. And again, you'll use that less and less the more experienced you become um, because you want, you'll want to unveil the story um, a, a, as a story as you go along. And then finally, getting ready. It's never too early to practice, the, to, to start early. The problem with PowerPoint now is that you can write it on the train on the way in. Um, in when I started, we had to make styles or slides that we had to make two weeks before we were ever going to a meeting, so we were always made well ahead of time. But make your, a bit like writing, make a start in your slides. Don't worry about the formatting. You can tidy them up later. Just get your ideas down and get the plan out. And practice, practice, practice. Um, as you practice, you might rearrange the slides because the story doesn't quite flow properly. I can't stress enough how important it is to practice. Um, I, as you get more and more experience, you'll need to practice less and less. But I practiced this talk this morning before I, I wrote it last night. I practiced it this morning um, before I left. So I ran through it with my dog beside me. Um, just make sure that it was about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and, I, and I took some slides out and moved things around. Um, really, pra you, ca you cannot practice enough. And actually, the speakers who give the appearance of just making it up as they're going along, it, it just feels like a story. It's just like a rambling tale are usually the ones who know exactly what's coming next. They've practiced this in ad nauseum. They know exactly what's coming. And then they have the freedom to move the language and it feels much more relaxed and it doesn't feel practiced. On the day, arrive early. I always try to come to a meeting um, before I, long before I'm, I'm due to talk. Uh, and I think you think you pick things up on the flavor of the meeting that are often very important. Be prepared to change your talk. If you think that the flavor of the meeting is completely different to what you've done, then pr be prepared to make some changes. And load your talk early. There's usually a speaker's room to do that. Check on formatting. If you're a Mac and this is a PC, make sure the tables and the graphs are, haven't been come corrupted. And if they've been corrupted, you're going to need time to change them on the new system. And of course, familiarize yourself with the AV system that, that you're going to be using so you don't look an idiot, you don't know how to change the slides and so, and so on and so forth. Keep an eye on time. Um, if you've practiced a talk a lot, you won't need time. I actually, I'm now at 29 minutes. I actually brought my iPhone with my clock on it because I only practiced it once this morning and I wanted to be within 30 minutes. But, but if you practice enough, you won't need to keep an eye on time. And then relax, talk slowly, you're, you're giving a story. Uh, and so talk as if you're just chatting to a mate about, uh, about your work. You are telling a story. And most importantly, be enthusiastic and excited. I mean, look what Ronaldo was like. My God, you know, you, you know I felt you know, energized. And um, <laughs> that's what you should be doing. If you're not excited about your work, then shit, no one else will be excited about your work. <laughs> yeah? So if you want to get your audience excited, you need to be excited. Uh, put a bit of humor in, like all your speakers have done today. And above all, enjoy your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, you and um, exceeded expectations as usual. Uh, now we will have time for some quick questions. We are going to extend uh, along a little, so we'll come. We'll have an afternoon tea, but we'll come back a little later at four o'clock. But are there any questions for you? And because he he is an expert, and th yeah, question here. There was a. Uh, an article published in the BMJ a few years ago titled Strong as an Ox and Half as Smart, which tested the hypothesis that orthopedic surgeons were half as smart as their anaesthetists. My question is, what do you think is, what do you think is the role of humour in research? Oh, research is life, and without humour, what is life? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like being English. Yeah? Um, so... Um, there, uh, of course, humour has a role in research. It has a role in, the, in every aspect of research in the lab because most days uh, in the lab, our work doesn't go the way we want it to go. And if you had no humour, you know, you'd be taking your own life. Um, it, so has, it has a role in the lab. It has a role in, in selling your research. Again, it's about, it's about engaging with your audience. I think... Um, you know, if you, read, if you go back and read Lancets from the 19th century, 1800s and early 20th century, um, there was great humour in the writing. I, I think we have lost some of that, and, and that's a great pity, um, because the, you know, our, our, our craft group, our profession, are extremely intellectual, extremely clever people, and we should be able to share that banter. So a huge role for humour. 
Any other any other questions? Yes, at the back there. We'll just get Aidan the microphone there. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the great talk. I just have a question about if you have any tips on how to handle a question from the audience after your talk um, about your <laughs> research. <laughs> And you really have no idea what they're talking about, but you want, you want to look smart. Yep. Is there a way around that? Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, no, so uh, one of the things I, one of my pet hates, I've got many pet hates actually, um, but one of my pet hates is the response. Um, Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have bloody asked the question if it wasn't a great question. Um, so so the reason, I think the reason that we do that, oh, that's a good question, is that we're just giving ourselves time to think. And so just take, silence is okay, just take time to think. You say, okay, if you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, um, then just say, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I say, so I don't really understand the question. Can you, can you rephrase the question for me? And it, it will happen. One of the things that we do in our group, and, and most groups do it, is um, particularly as the students or the young postdocs are giving talks, important talks at major meetings, is that we rehearse their talks a lot. In fact, we rehearse the talks for internal meetings. So when our BMED science students present within our department, uh, my lab will present their talks um, a couple of times over the weeks before. Uh, and the reason that we do that is two reasons. One is to make sure the talk is good, but also as you practice your talk internally within your own department or your own institute, is you will get questions. And uh, one of the things I did, when I mean, I did my research training in Edinburgh. I knew that when I left Edinburgh um, to give a talk somewhere else, I would never get questioned as aggressively or as harshly as I did in my home institute. institute. And while it feels bruising, it means that you can you can trot the globe knowing that no one is going to ask you anything more difficult than uh, you had at home. So I think it, practice it lots, get people to ask you questions lots, but if you genuinely, and it will happen, if you genuinely had a question that you have no idea, just ask them to rephrase the question for you. And if you don't know, um, then just say, look, I'm sorry, I don't know. And you know, particularly your, your younger people who are presenting the work of the lab, um, and as you heard from Ronaldo, you know, you, you can't, the younger people can't know everything. And if you genuinely don't know, just say, I'm sorry, I don't know. And, and if there are no other questions, and I think because we are getting out of time, I'll just thank you and again for a really um, amazing and excellent talk. Thank you so much. And